Family, faith, families, welcome uh, parishioners uh, for our presentation tonight. Now, I know it says Tolkien in the Eucharist, but we're going to branch out a little bit because we, uh, you know, it, it's kind of broad. So, uh, so we are going to, uh, you know, the subtitle of the talk is Reclaiming Wonder and All in the Eucharist because obviously in family faith, we've, the, we've been focusing on the Eucharist. We've been uh, focusing on uh, reigniting our, our love for the Eucharist and our desire for it. And then Deacon uh, Keith has creatively uh, called this uh, a reawakening of enchantment, so reclaiming wonder and awe in the Eucharist through the writings of uh, J.R. Tolkien, C.S. Lewis. We'll look at a little G.K. Chesterton. Now, are there any um, uh, Tolkien nerds here tonight? Well, there's a few Tolkien. Now, so, okay, so those of you that are not... Uh, that's okay. We will explain uh, some of the characters or what have you uh, that we're going to be talking about, but there's, there's going to be good stuff, okay, because we're talking about awe and wonder. We're, we're talking about reawakening uh, that sense of adventure, of imagination, uh, of good stories, right? We, we all love a good story, okay? And obviously, we should be basing our lives on a true story, and that's the, the story of God's love for us, right? Uh, through the sacraments and, and, and through nature and, and just all the ways through other people, how God manifests himself to us. So before I get too far in, uh, let's us pause for a moment and pray, okay? In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity to be together. Uh, we thank you for the gift of our faith and of our families. I, I want to lift up to you. Uh, those families in our family faith formation, as well as our, our parishioners, who are our, our parish family, all of us here together. We uh, thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for the gift of story. We thank you for the gift of imagination. We thank you uh, for poets and, and writers and artists and musicians and storytellers, those who bring uh, 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 bring. Uh, uh, the truth about what it means to be human to us through their stories. And uh, we ask you to bless our gathering tonight, bless our conversation, and we thank you for the gift of J.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, G.K. Chesterton, these wonderful writers who put their finger on the pulse uh, of, of our hearts and, and just uh, bring uh, everything to life for us. In the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Sorry, I almost talked myself into a circle. Okay, good. Uh, that's the problem with spontaneous prayers. There's great seats up front, folks. Okay, all right, good. Um, so again, uh, I, I just want to start by asking, um, uh, does anybody, anybody have like a favorite story that, that you grew up with? I mean, it could be a Disney story, story your parents read to you. Anyone want to, anybody want to be brave? Oh, right in the front row, yes. <laughs> Winnie the Pooh. Winnie, Winnie the, the Pooh. Pooh. Yeah. Can you say why Winnie the Pooh captivated you so much? He's just a simple character. He just, just does his thing. Just, uh, he does his Poo thing, thing, right? Yes. Okay. Good, good, good. All right. Yes. Star Wars. Star Wars. Da, 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 da. Wrong universe. You need to go to a different talk. Okay. That's not what we're talking about. No, I'm kidding. Okay. Good. All right. Good. Um, good. But Star Wars, Luke Skywalker, that sense of adventure, right? Okay. Yes. Did anybody, did anybody ever uh, grow, anybody grew up with Where the Wild Things Are? Anybody, who has not heard of Where the Wild Things Are? No one there. Uh, really? Okay, well, check it out. Amazing kid's story. Yes, yes. Uh, anyone else? Uh, yes, yes. Anne of the Green Gables. Okay, yes, there you go. Awesome, awesome. Good, good. Yeah, did you think about all these stories that used to captivate us? Anybody remember uh, uh, Three Billy Goats Gruff? How about the first time you saw Fantasia, right? I mean, it's amazing. As I say, we just captivate us. The power of stories. And, and it's so important, too, that we go back to those, those little moments in time that we grew up with. Uh, unless you become like a child, you shall not enter the kingdom of God, right? 
uh, the power of stories the, the, and what they can do and where they can take us and, and the power of the words and the way the writers write them. So this is going to be a little bit different class than we've had. And it's not even really class. Let's not even look at it. Let's look at it as sort of taking a little venture. So I, I want to, uh, we're, so we're going to wrap the story. Now, if you've heard any of my homilies last couple of weeks I've been talking about, is your life based on a true story or a false story, right? Our lives are based on a true story, and good stories always have the, the ability to, to help us to encounter the transcendent, right? We believe in one God. So transcendent means, uh, like, we believe in one God, maker of all things visible and invisible, okay? We're not just meat skeletons, or I just heard this one from the atheists, moist robots, you're like, we're just moist robots, man. That's all we are, just a lump. That's kind of gross. Ew. I hate the word moist, too, except when we're talking about cake. All right, but anyway, you know, so, so, you know, so there's more to us. We are flesh and spirit, right? We are in fleshed spirits, okay? And so, so when we look at our world, you know, why have we lost our sense of awe and wonder in the Eucharist? Well, you know, we, we've really lost our sense of wonder and awe in everything. We don't wonder anymore. We don't want, you know, and, and we've sort of, what we call that's reductionism. Everything is reduced down to, so I was having a nice glass of wine the other night with some friends, and their son was there. He's in his late 20s, and we were talking about my, I just spent, Deacon Keith, Ken, Keith and I, Deacon Keith and I were just at this retreat all week, and, and uh, Hemingway came up, the old man in the sea, you know that, you think, it's just about a story of a guy who catches a fish. I'm like, what? He's like, it's all it is. It's just a, it's a, that's all it is. It's, it's a guy and he catches a fish. I'm like, oh, really? So is it any wonder when we look at the Eucharist, all we see is bread, right? You know, we just take the power of words, you know, and our word, what word, in the beginning was the Word and the Word became flesh, and, and the the and the and the Word was God, right? You know, God speaks words, and and the water He creates the world, right? He uh, on the seven He speaks, and it comes into existence, right? Uh, the God of the universe uh, breaks into history, right? So, is it any wonder that we've lost sense of the power of the sacraments, right, and where they can take us? So. Uh, uh, so I want to start, we're going to start we're here with some G.K. Chesterton, okay? And Dale Alquist is, is a great Chestertonian. You like that? That's a guy that studies Chesterton, a Chestertonian, right? And, and so, uh, listen, he, he wrote this, uh, and then he, he has this beautiful quote from G.K. Chesterton. So Alquist writes, there is no excuse for being bored. Mom, Dad, I'm so bored. Here, take a screen and entertain thyself, right? Okay? Take the holy screen and open it up and it will take you wherever you want, right? Okay, so I'm, I'm uh, and yet the modern world is bored. Our entertainment grows louder, flashier, and more bizarre in ever more desperate attempts to just keep our attention. Desperate attempts to keep our intention, right? Keep our attention. Uh, does anybody enjoy fall? How many of you went to the metro parks and looked at the leaves, okay, and listened to the leaves, right, and, and the colors, the oranges, the golds, the reds? Did anybody seem like one of those cool leaf tornadoes? And you're just like, that's awesome, right? It's like the Holy Spirit is just like, yeah. You, know, you try to pull your phone out. By the time you get your phone out, it's gone, right? Because we got to put everything inside this thing now, right? We can't just sit there and gaze and say, thank you, Jesus. i got to get it on my phone, right? Okay, um, right? So someone will notice me, right? And, and we don't do that. How, jumping in the leaves. Your kids jump in the leaves still? Break the big pile of leaves. Oh, the smell, isn't it? And burning leaves. Oh, my gosh. The smell of burning leaves. Amazing. Like, the guys were out grinding the leaves today. You know, like, in the, they drove around. And I just went out, and the aroma of the ground leaves was, it was invigorating. It penetrated my nostrils, right? It was wonderful. So, so, so G.K. Chesterton wrote this in, in Tremendous Trifles. He said, <coughs> and this is so true. The world will never starve for want of wonders, but only for want of wonder. There are no dreary sights, he declares, only dreary sightseers. Right? <laughs> anybody, 
Anybody remember the, the, the first vacation movie, the Chevy Chase? You guys know what I'm talking about? Remember they get to the Grand Canyon? His family's there, and he's like, boom, 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 boom. Okay, let's go. Like, Cl Clark, it's the Grand Canyon. Oh, yeah, honey, it's great. Let's go. You know, because he wants to get to Wally World. Never mind. Okay. All right. You, you know what I'm talking about, right? We, you know, it's like we lost that sense of just wasting time being in the presence of God. We, it, it, this has been one of the most beautiful Novembers. It's going to be, it's going to be 60 degrees. Okay, and I think I'm going to pass it off to Samwise now. Okay. Samwise. Can I be Frodo this time? Be I think, Frodo. Okay, I'll be Frodo. You yeah. be Samwise. Okay, good. All the people are like, who is that? Who are we talking about? All right. Um, <laughs> I, just, I just love that, that picture, right? That kid just gazing out. It's just it's captivating for me because it just really speaks to that, that, that wonder that we have as children, right? The things that just, just caught our imagination and we could just spend hours with them. Today and now it's just like, oh, but what are the next thing? So, um, the stories of Tolkien and Lewis, they invite us into an adventure, an encounter. Uh, we have people who've read Lewis at all, Chronicles of Narnia, that kind of stuff, seen the movies, etc. right? Mm -hmm. These are just beautiful stories, beautiful stories that draw us into the true story, okay? The true story that uh, the Father's been talking about, that story of our, of our faith and, and, and who we are and whose we are. Um, but, the, you know, often the world is going to tell us, you know, that's a waste of time. I don't have time for that kind of stuff. I don't have time for little kids' stories. I mean, these are fairy stories. I mean, I'm a grown person. Why would I spend time with this stuff, and, et cetera? Um, they're missing the point. That's why, right? What are some of the fruits um, of time wasted? And I put that in quotes because it's certainly not wasted time in these great stories or in the other stories of your life, you know, wasting time in them. One is a love of the ordinary. A love of the ordinary. We walk around and just kind of miss the beauty of the ordinary, if you will, right? Luke, uh, Tolkien, when he talked about how, if you want to know how it is that I created this whole universe, if you want to call it that, Middle Earth, it was because of the love of the Earth. It's the, it, it, he saw within the Earth just the amazing things that, that there were, and he just continued to write about those, right? A love of the ordinary, G.K. Chesterton, um, I remember reading one of the, it was a series of essays he wrote, and, and he talked about that, and, and that, that kid kind of gazing reminds me of a couple of things. One, like to, to a young boy, if he's walking around, he's looking at uh, blades of grass, I mean, the, would, someone would wonder their swords, their mighty swords that he could look at, or, you know, a kid picks up a stick, it's nothing, it's not just a stick ever, right? You know, when your sons do that. Um, he also talked at one point about just the ordinary traffic. And I thought this was cool. It's kind of nerdy, but I liked it. So he talked about the traffic light. It's like it's not just a you know a, a light there. It is a it is a box of life and death where the flames are <laughs> telling you when to go and not to go, and just this box of life and death. And I know it's nerdy, but when you think of the world that way, you see the ordinary in an extraordinary way. You know, it draws you into something. It makes the world come to life, and it draws you into. Um, get restless for that. Like, who would you rather live in a world where a traffic light is a traffic light or where it's a box of life and death, right? That's the second is just much more engaging, much more fun, and it calls us into that, right? A sense of the eternal and transcendent, right? Those stories continuously speak to that which is to come, uh, that which we long for, the hungers of our hearts, etc., and it draws us into that which is um, the invisible. So by pointing out these, these, these things within the visible world, they call us to uh, the things that we can't see, so to speak. And abiding in elusive joy. Um, how many people are feeling super joyful all the time? <laughs> you, okay. One you're person. Fine. You are. <laughs> I can say that. <laughs> I struggle with joy at times, right? It's hard to be joyful at times. There's so many things going on. So the world's just crashing about us. We got things we got to do. I got a new puppy that keeps waking me up in the middle of the night still. Um, you know, it's hard to be joyful. And to escape into these stories just elicits that sense of joy. And I know Father Kevin Fox at 9 o'clock has said this, and um, it was said at our class last week as well. Um, Tolkien was once accused of, like, these things are just escapes. They're escapes for people. And he was accused as if that was a, a bad thing, right? They just want to 
people escape. Because there's a certain number of forms of escaping, right? And one is, if you're in prison, escaping is a good thing. It's a desire you ought to want to have. And he looked at the world, he says, we're just locked in to this, this prison of, the, of, of some of the things of the world, and to escape from that is a good thing. A clarity of good and evil. There aren't like lots of great lines in these things. These stories, you know what is good, you know what is evil, and it, it, it gives us a sense of that. So we're not you know, like confused so many times now uh, that that gets muddied up, uh, to say the least. A thirst for deep communion with creation, others, and God. All right. So how many people did know Tolkien or the Lord of the Rings? Uh, okay. So like you see a tree, right? Well, now, if you know the story, the tree is bent, right? It walks, it talks, it comes to life in, in mm -hmm. these stories. They have walking trees. I thought that was like the coolest thing ever, right? When I first saw the, uh, the movies, and I must admit, I've seen the movies and started to read the books. So I'm more of a movie into the books guy than the other way around. But I now love trees. And he, he awakened some of that in me, okay? Trees tell the, the great story of life. Trees, every year, in the spring, they come to life, right? And then they have their, their season of the summer, and now they're fall approaching, they can't be good to have, right? And the trees are, are just so beautiful right now, right? And then they're going to they're gonna die in winter, but it speaks, we wait, we know they will resurrect again. They tell the story of life, death, and resurrection. One of the other things is, when are they most beautiful? most beautiful in the spring and in the fall. You know, so when we look around, and it's like the young people, you know, like everybody, when you see a baby, it's like, oh, right? Mm -hmm. And the elderly, just having the elderly among us and just the, the great wisdom and the beauty of a life lived well, those trees tell that story. So it gives us a thirst for those types of things. Empathy and compassion. So many characters within the stories just elicit that within us. For me, and if you won't know the character, it's Gollum, okay? But he's this creature that was just a, he was a, a regular hobbit, a good, a, good, um, a good person, we'll say that. And he was just taken by this evil uh, desire for this ring. And he has this physical transformation where he just, his, the, what is going on in the interior of his soul, if you will, is manifested externally. And he's just this hideous creature. And multiple times, it's like, you know, I wish we had just killed him, right? No, 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 no. You know, he's got a part to play. The empathy that was shown towards him. When you learn his backstory, he was just like the, the heroes of the story. And he fell, and you just have that empathy for him. You feel a sadness for him. You have a desire that, you know, we wish to be different. A sense of mission adventure. You know, Father already talked about that. These, these stories call us into, oh, you know, you just want to you, you get into that. The desire to share the good, true, and beautiful, to say to others, taste and see, right? When you're captivated by these things, you, you want to draw others into them, right? That's Sidney is saying with our faith. One quick kind of backstory of how this really looks. So we were in class, and, and one of the things that he was going through was the similarity, which is um, his prequel, if you will, to Tolkien's prequel to The Lord of the Rings. In the beginning of that, he has this creation story that he does. Um, and he changed the names. It's very beautiful, etc. Father Barry and I are listening to him. Yeah, that's kind of cool. He wants to creation story to do the time instead of God. You know, but we, we maybe more just drawn into it. At least I was. I'm like, it's cool, whatever. Well, in front of us, there was a woman who she grew up not religious, and but her dad had read her the stories, and she had read the stories. She knew the stories well. And so when she was first introduced to the faith and first heard the creation story, it found a warm place in her heart because she had loved the story that Tolkien had spun together and she was able to just make that simple step into the faith and she was drawn right into it because of the beauty of the stories that she had encountered. So discovering Tolkien. So I'll take you through this real quick and we'll give it back to Father Barry. Um, I kind of touched on this. For many people, it's the reading of those epics that first gave them that deep, erotic longing for a transcendent cultural um, otherness. We met about 90 of them last week, right? These <laughs> people were moved by these stories, right? Eros, and I'll hit the 
quote in a minute. Eros is the beginning of human moral life and beauty in art and literature are oftentimes more effective than religion in awakening Eros within us. Eros, that word um, oftentimes in our society has a bad connotation. You think of Eros or erotic or whatever. But the Greek word Eros really means an inner power that draws man toward all that is good, true, and beautiful was placed in each and every one of us by God himself to draw us to that which is true, good, and beautiful, to draw us to him, okay? And when we take that and we recognize it, we try to fill with the things of the world, we eventually come to the conclusion that nothing in this world is going to fulfill that. So there must be something uh, that we're called to, right? And it's to him. It's placed in there so that we will learn that nothing here can satisfy us only Religion can seem like God coming down on us, scolding us, telling us to stay where we are but just do better. But real religion must awaken the movement in the other direction, make us come out of ourselves and move towards him, fall in love with him. It's about beginning an adventure, becoming a pilgrim, an exile, a lover, really. And that's what these gentlemen really set out to do, was to take that and to, to tell these other stories so that when we're drawn into that true story, that we have that sense of awe, wonder, and desire um, within our hearts. I'm glad that you're here with me, Sam, here at the end of all things. Okay, just a couple people got that. All right, good. Uh, so we're not going to go over to C.S. Lewis, but I, I, I do love uh, that, that quote from uh, Tolkien. It, uh, and it reminds me of a, a quote from G.K. Chesterton. He said, you know, let your religion be less of a theory and more of a love story. Let your religion be less of a theory than more, and more of a love story. I did not grow up with that, okay? I was like, you know, God is up there. He wants to smote you. If you don't do it, uh, if you don't do what you're supposed to, God's going to get you, right? And, and so, uh, again, this is what these poets do. This is what these writers do is they get us in touch with that ache, that yearn, that desire that we have uh, uh, to, to, for the transcendent, where we, we have this God-shaped hole in our hearts that only he can satisfy, right? C.S. Lewis, he said, if nothing in this world satisfies me, and nothing, then it's only logical I have been created for something greater, okay? So listen to, this is from a, a, a kind of a sermon that C.S. Lewis wrote called The Weight of Glory, and listen to this this is beautiful, uh, a beautiful, beautiful observation. And he's talking about uh, the things that are beautiful and how we, we can encounter beauty in these ordinary things with the power of imagination, okay? So he writes this. The books or the music in which we thought the beauty was located will betray us if we trust to them. It was not in them. It only came through them. And what came through them was longing. These things, the beauty, the memory of our own past are good images of what we really desire. So you think about maybe some of your favorite vacations or favorite places you've been where you've truly felt free and, and, and you just truly felt uh, uh, this, this joy in your hearts, those beautiful memories that we have of growing up. But if they are mistaken for the thing itself, they turn into dumb idols, breaking the hearts of their worshipers, right? So we, we can't stay there. We, we need to continue, right, to, 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 to find that beauty, to find what's eluding us. For they are not the thing itself. They are only the scent of a flower we have not found, right? The echo of a tune we have not heard. News from a country we have not yet visited. Here, then, is the desire still wandering and uncertain of the object. Where is it that we all want to go? Where the streets have no name, right? Okay, that's the mystic Bono, right? Uh, okay, right? We, so, so the flowers that are... The, the, you the, think about what... You think about a beautiful rose. Do you know what the roses probably look like in heaven? Right? Can you imagine what the roses are like in heaven? <gasps> Right, right. Uh, you know the tune that we, the, the choirs of angels. Who was at the eleven o'clock mass this past week with the 
children's choir. Oh my gosh, they were little angels, weren't they? That is just a taste, a glimmer of the choirs of heaven, right? Um, this is the desire still wandering and uncertain of the object, right? And what do we do in our lust for, uh, or excuse me, in our, our desire for communion and union with the transcendent with God, we can turn objects into idols, right? Unhealthy attachments, okay? And, and that's what he's talking about there. We want the glory. We want something out. And that's what good stories do. Good stories bring that out in us, right? And, and uh, uh, we, we, of course, in the Catholic faith, we have the greatest story ever told, right? And then we have sacraments the power that make the invisible visible, and we share the words from the story, and, and we, then we are able to participate in concrete realities, right? Okay, uh, uh, like I said, in the beginning of creation, God spoke and the world came into being, right? What does Jesus say? You know, take this, all of you, and eat of it. This is my body, which will become, this is my blood. The words, the priest acts as an altar Christus, another Christ, and he says the words, and we believe in the transformative power that a simple piece of bread ultimately becomes the body, the blood, the soul, and the divinity of uh, Christ. And now, listen to how these beautiful poets, because again, uh, Tolkien and Lewis were very shaped by their belief in God. And Tolkien specifically was a devout Catholic. Uh, his story is, he, he was raised, he and his brother were raised by a Catholic priest because he lost his parents very young in life, okay? And his mom was very good friend with these. I could not imagine this happening now. Uh, Father, um, if anything happens to me, uh, my eight-year-old and 12-year-old son, they're yours. Make sure they are taken care of. Right? <laughs> you know, as I knock on the door here, Father, do something with these two, will you? And it's like, uh, okay, right? But that's what happened with Tolkien and his brother. Okay, so, so Tolkien wrote this letter uh, to his sons, okay, his two sons, and and two, right? Yeah, two. two sons. Yeah, two. Yeah, right. Okay, so listen to this. He wrote this speaking about the Eucharist. Out of the darkness of my life, so much frustrated, I put before you the one great thing to love on earth, the blessed sacrament. There you will find, this is amazing. There in the, how, when's the last time you received Eucharist you thought about this? There you will find romance, glory, honor, fidelity, and the true way of all your loves on earth, which alone can what you seek in your earthly relationships, love, faithfulness, joy, be maintained. Or take on that complexion of reality of eternal endurance, which every man's heart desires. The only cure for sagging or fainting faith is communion. Though always itself perfect and complete and inviolate, the blessed sacrament does not operate completely and once for all in any of us. Like an act of faith, it must be continuous and grow by exercise. So it's strength, it's food, it's nourishment. Uh, it, it, for, for, it, it's meant to keep us strengthened along the way. You know, are you faltering in your faith? Receive the Eucharist because that is the body and blood of Christ. We, we need that for the journey. And it, it has to, we have to continue to grow. What happens if we don't exercise enough? You know, we, 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 we get out of shape. That the same thing happens within us, right? And so we, we, need, we, we need and desire this sacrament. God put that there. That's why we have this gift. And within there, you will find romance, glory, honor, fidelity, and the true way of all your loves on earth. I love that because... Uh, this is the story of stories, right? Uh, we need communion. We need those relationships. We need the romance, right? You know, right in the middle of all the Bible is a, a beautiful love, is, love poetry is the Song of Songs. And it is very beautiful. Hark, my lover, you know, her hair is like a flock of goats <laughs> streaming down the hills of meeting, right? Right? Well, that is very beautiful, right? I don't recommend that, saying that to your... But, right. but, but I mean, it's like her, her, her eyes are like doves. Bird's eyes are creepy. I don't know. But anyway, but anyway, but, it's just, it's just, but that's, but that's, he's, he's encountering and he's thinking about that in the ordinary, right? Probably a shepherd, right? Okay. Am I done for now? Am I tapping? Okay. Yeah. Here you go. Sam. Mm -hmm. So this is, um, what's this 
Lewis had to say about the Blessed Sacrament and, and really hidden, I'm sorry, Christ hidden in the Blessed Sacrament and in each other. Okay, from that same sermon, The Weight of Glory, um, he had this to say. It is with the awe and the circumspection proper to them that we should conduct all our dealings with one another. All friendships, all loves, all play, all politics. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Next to the Blessed Sacrament itself, your neighbor is the holiest object presented to your senses. If he's your Christian neighbor, he is holy in almost the same way. For in him also Christ, the glorifier and the glorified, glory himself is truly him. That, I think, is simply amazing. Okay? You have never met a mere mortal. There are no ordinary people. We should, you know, next to the blessed sacrament, the next holiest object is the person sitting right next to you. Okay? This should shape how we look at each other. It should shape how we conduct ourselves with one another. My wife tells me I'm weird, and she's absolutely correct. Um, we work, when we work with the couples uh, for marriage, we will always tell them to um, this kind of thing. It's like, recognize the pearl of great price that sits next to you. The one, the only one like that, right? We should walk, if, if we really understood this, we would walk up to people and say, oh my gosh, I've never seen one like you. Mm. You are amazing, right? You are so unique, so unrepeatable, so irreplaceable, the pearl of great price, something of great beauty and joy, and it should take over us, right? And if we could just get just a glimmer of that within our, uh, within our culture, within our lives, just think of the difference that we would, uh, we would make, of the difference of how we would conduct ourselves, etc. And so I just find it just so beautiful in how he sees both in in the Eucharist itself, and us, the tabernacle, right? That those that are supposed to, at the end of Mass, receive Christ and then become Christ to others. This is exactly what he's telling us here, right? I think we're just going back and forth now. This is you. Oh, we're just going back and forth. <laughs> okay, we're good. You and me. All right, fruits of Holy Communion. I'm going to give you a bowl. Okay, so, so this is, um, now, now listen to what the catechism uh, of the church says and how it ties all this together. And, and, and I want you to think about the beauty of this, this language here, even. The, the, and this is, uh, this is coming, this is the voice of Holy Mother Church here, okay? So what material food produces in our bodily life, Holy Communion, wonderfully achieves in our spiritual life? Remember, we are not just moist robots. We are body and spirit. And, and we are made to commune with the transcendent God, one God, maker of all things visible and invisible. How we take this, this so for granted. It has become so ordinary, uh, this reductionism of our faith, right? Uh, Pope, uh, in the spirit of the liturgy, Pope Benedict XVI talks about the banality of uh, what the banality uh, has done to, uh, how banality has crept into modern liturgy. But banality is like uh, boring, plain, simple. We've, you know, uh, re like when you walk into an old church with the, the pillars and all the beautiful artwork all over the place, right? It, it takes us somewhere else. It, it transports us, right? And so, uh, uh, so this is what Holy Communion, communion with the flesh of the risen Christ, a flesh given life and giving life through the Holy Spirit, okay? Communion with the flesh of the risen Christ preserves, increases, and renews the life of grace received at baptism. So it takes us back to that beginning, right? Uh, you know, in the waters of baptism, we die and rise with Christ. Eh, they're just pouring water on a baby's head. No, they're being born and raised again, right? They're dying and rising again, right? You see how beautiful that is? This growth in Christian life needs the nourishment of Eucharistic communion, the bread of our pilgrimage, 
until the moment of death when it will be given to us as viaticum. So that's the fancy word for before you die, you receive the bread of life, ideally, in an ideal, perfect world. So pray for more priests so there's one able to come and see you when you're dying. Okay? Good. Um, that was rather grim. Okay. 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 So we need you to pray for more priests. Okay, good. Uh, having passed from this world to the Father, Christ gives us the Eucharist, the pledge of glory with him. Participation in the holy sacrifice identifies us with his heart. How beautiful is that? With his heart. Your heart conjoins with the heart of the divine. It sustains our strength along the pilgrimage of this life. Makes us long for eternal life. That yearning, right? And unites us even now to the church in heaven. The blessed Mary and all the saints. You are made for communion, right? Right? That, that is so important for us to remember. We aren't made for isolation and desolation. I, I was watching, I was really hooked on this series. Anybody ever see this series called Alone? And so they take these professional survivors and there's like 12 of them and they put them out in these remote places with just their backpack and it's whoever can last the longest, right? And a few of them, it's because of physical malnutrition they get pulled out. But do you know what, what most of them, what takes them down and they can't complete the challenge is loneliness, isolation, desolation. They, they yearn for their hearth and home. They yearn to be in communion again. It's the isolation. What, what's the worst forms of punishment? Solitary confinement, right? I am a rock. I am an island, right? No man is an island. Okay, sorry. That, it's, it, we don't, can't live that way. Right? It, we can't do that. So that would be the hardness of heart, right? Okay, good. Am I back to you, Sam? Check, check, yeah. Check, okay, back to you. All right. So we, these last couple slides, this one here, we're seeing what Holy Mother Church says about the Eucharist, right? We see the bread for our pilgrimage, right? Bread for the journey. Um, sustains our strength along that journey. You know, makes us long for eternal life and unites us, right? So now we're going to finally get here to the last slide, which is like basically like the title of the talk. Yeah. <laughs> but all this is beautiful, right? Mm -hmm. So what we're going to take a look at is um, Tolkien's overt symbol of the Eucharist within the Lord of the Rings, okay? And it's the Legolas bread, all right? So we have on the left there is an elf Legolas, and he's receiving the bread for the first time in the movie, and, and he has this wonder and joy of, of what is being given to him. What we have over here on the right is Frodo. He is um, actually a symbol of uh, Christ the priest. Okay, within the, within the movie, there are three characters, Aragorn, Gandalf, Frodo, uh, and they each have a, a character of Christ that they display. Gandalf, the wizard, he's Christ the prophet. Aragorn, the, the warrior, is Christ the king. Frodo is Christ the priest because he gives a great sacrifice and he carries that ring. He shoulders the burdens of all mankind, of all of Middle Earth, literally on his shoulders and has to take it into the depths of hell and destroy it, right? So we see Frodo here toward the, the point of the journey where he is ragged. He's worn out. He's been just, you know, through so much and it's the lembus. It's the lembus that... Uh, nourishes him and strengthens him and, and enables him to continue uh, to, to persevere and to push forward. Okay? So we're looking at just a couple of things within the uh, within that story of the Lemnus bread that kind of point to our faith. Some of this stuff should sound familiar to you as we read in the book. So first it's supplied by, and I put it in quotes, Mary. Okay, so it's supplied by Mary. The person who brings the Lemnus to the fellowship is Lady Galadriel. Okay, and within the story, she is one of the symbols uh, for Mary. I won't break that down for you. You just have to trust me on that. <laughs> Go read the books and they'll come to you. Okay, so it's, it comes through Mary, just like Christ was brought to us from, through Mary, right? So through Mary. And in explaining it, the elves say, and this should sound quite familiar, eat little at a time and only in need. For these things are given to serve you when all else fails. The cakes will keep sweet for many, many days if they're unbroken and left in their leaf wrappings as we have brought them. One will keep a traveler on his feet for a day of long labor, even if he be one of the tall men of Minas Tirith. Mm -hmm. 
So just the, the, the notion that just, just a small piece of this, small host that you receive, the abundant life that you receive through that host, right? It's right in that language. And I have here just a short clip from uh, the movie um, when the Lemnus is brought to them by Lady Galadriel. <laughs> <laughs> Every evening from the start of the day to the breaks, more broad walks now along the eastern shore of the evening. All the fancy things are blessed to be back. Strange creatures bear them up the white hand we can see on our borders. Seven of the walks of journey in the open under the sun, yet these have done so. Boat. Oh, what's a boat symbol of? The church. The church, right? They're climbing into, a, into this boat. And what do they load it with? They load it with the lemnus, right? The, you know, boats are loaded with the lemnus. Um, and you see at the end, he's got, you know, he's got that sword, sword there. They're going to battle, right? And so it's just right there, that imagery of uh, you know, going into battle uh, within the church um, and, and, and the lemnus, you know, contained within the church. Um, I just I just think that's even that short little clip, you could just see the the genius of, of, of how they tell the story, right? And that's kind of one of our goals for this evening, or at least one of mine is um, I left there last week wishing my kids were still like this big so I could read them these stories, you know, and they would pay attention. Now that's like I don't know if I thought I'd do that. Because um, <laughs> what a gift. What a gift it would be. And I'm gonna do that with my grandkids. Take that advantage, right? Because it's such an opportunity to, to, to engage them in wonderful stories and just point out the faith to them, you know, through these stories and, and it's something that's truly engaged with as well. Strength for the journey, okay? So what we see within the books is this, this notion of the lemnus of strength for the journey. We talked about Aragorn. Uh, he's, the, he's the Christ the King, if you will. He's a great warrior. Legolas is he's the, the, the elf there on the left. And then Gimli's this dwarf. He's awesome. Um, and they're, they're chasing after Barry and Pippin. Those were the two guys that you saw eat four of those things, right? They've been captured by these orcs, which are fallen elves. Yeah, elves are angels. I think maybe point elves that out. Elves are angels, yeah. right? So within his story, there are angels. And these orcs are these evil built beings, which are fallen elves, okay? And as they're chasing after him, this is what Tolkien wrote. Often in their hearts, they thank the Lady of Moria for the gift of Lemnus, where they could eat of it and find new strength even as they ran. So as they're, you know, battling it and heading out there, they find that strength in the Lemnus. Bread, which feeds the will, okay? We want to align our wills to, to the Lord's will, and it's within the Eucharist that we are strengthened and able to be to be doing these things, we see that same thing within um, within the story here. And what he's talking about here, uh, this is Sam and Frodo. Okay, so the two the two uh, friends that are uh, taking this journey together, right? And uh, he's writing this about how the Lembus uh, strengthened them. The Lembus had a virtue, a virtue, without which they would have long ago have lain down to die. It fed the will. It gave strength to endure and to master sinew and limb beyond the measure of a mortal kind. I just think that's just so awesome. And it's the same thing with us, certainly, within the Eucharist, right?
right? It gives us the strength to go out there, right? And at the end of Mass, right, we're sent forth. We are to receive the Eucharist, and when we head out, you know, as the members of the church out there to you know, make a difference out in the world, and I think these two, uh, you know, these, these gentlemen for sure, and then this story in particular, has great things to say about that. Mm -hmm. We got 30 seconds? Really? Is that all? A minute or so. Yeah. About a minute. We're gonna, I mean, the parishioners are welcome to stay. I, family faith, you got to get your kids. Sorry. Questions? So, no, I'm kidding. No, it's good. you got to get your kids. But uh, anybody have any th quick thoughts, observations, something that struck you or anyone? I, again, we, we were at a week-long, what is it, 30 class hours? <laughs> And we have basically just summarized it for you here in 45 minutes. So, I, okay, so, but, uh, so we, we, there's a lot of ways we could have went with this. So I hope it wasn't too scattered for you. And maybe just whetted your appetite to, you know, maybe, you know, I, I always recommend the books. I read the books, but the movies can whet your appetite. The, the Lord of the Rings movie by Peter Jackson. And then there was a Chronicles of Narnia film that I think was pretty well done. I've not seen that one, but um, uh, it's pretty good. So... Um, but uh, anybody have any thoughts or anything? Or? Yes, sir. Okay. Oh, did I get that microphone? Well, it's just so they could hear. Uh, I'm curious to know what Legolas and Gimli are to Christ, just because, you know, the character. You said each character plays a role of Christ. Frodo's the priest. Just what is Gimli? Three, oh, just, just those three? Those three are okay, because I was curious to know what Gimli yeah, would Yeah, so like Gandalf would be like a prophet. Uh, he could also be a Christ figure yeah. in a sense, but he's more of a prophetic voice. Uh, and then Frodo would be the priest, and Aragorn, obviously, the king. Is, you know, right. Yeah, right. Well, he did that yeah. work, so he mm -hmm. didn't just put, like, okay, this is Christ. He took those priest, prophet, and king, and just put them into characters. It's yeah. the same with Mary. Yeah, so his... Multiple figures with Yeah, he, his faith shaped his world. I mean, his, the story. It was rooted from his faith. That's why it's so important that we base our lives on, on this true, profound story, because every good story, what? It has a hero. It has a villain, it has some kind of fall, right? And then it has redemption, right? Who wants to watch a movie that doesn't have that, right? You know, it, it always a battle between good and evil. The hero looks like he's gone or he dies or he comes back. Remember E.T., when little E.T.? He, he's alive, remember that? And, and then he's riding on the bike and they're flying, it's cool. Does anybody remember E.T.? Okay, never mind. But those, those are great stories. Why do they touch our hearts, right? You know, it's all about redemption, death and re resurrection. That's always a good story. You know, I, no one likes a depressing story, right? Okay. Any, yes, uh, uh, Jose. Nice and loud. The one thing I, that I appreciate the most about him is, particularly in the Lord of the Rings, how you get to the point where, I mean, it's dark. Mm -hmm. It's very dark, yes. Yes. At the battles of Helm's Deep on the morning of the fifth day, look to the east, right? And Gandalf and the riders of Rohirrim and the, 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 the dawn, the sun's, sun's rising behind them. Yeah. Yeah, night is always darkest before the dawn, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great, great point. The light and dark themes, yeah, between darkness and the light. Anyone else? Okay, I, I, for me, for some of you, it was like, okay, this was, we really nerded out a little bit tonight on Tolkien, but that's okay. Maybe, hopefully, if we inspired something, tell the stories, you know, tonight, but when you go to bed, what's your child's favorite bedtime story? Put a little more chutzpah into it tonight, maybe, okay? <laughs> and tell the story with some oomph, uh, or that desire, of, uh, the German word is Sehnsucht, the desire for horizons to go out and adventure, Sehnsucht. Isn't that a cool word? All right, so you learn, you even, at the very least, you learned a German word tonight, Sehnsucht, the inner desire to admire and to seek what is beautiful, right? Okay? All right, the Lord be with you. And May the blessing of Almighty God come down upon you and remain with you forever, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We'll be up here for a few minutes. If uh, Samwise and Frodo will be up here if you have any other <laughs> follow